Welcome to section four of the lecture, our final part. So let's remember again what Anubhata is trying to do. He's trying to establish an invariable relationship between two things. In the last example, there were a couple of ways to uh, understand that relationship. First, look for a place where the prover and the thing to be proved, smoke and fire, are both found. Next, look for a place where the thing to be proved, that is fire, is not found, and where the prover, smoke, is not found as well. But what about relationships where there are no examples of absences? What about a relationship between two things that are always found together, and where it's impossible to find an example of either being absent? This is the case for one inference about a pot. The inference is this. A pot is something which is nameable. And why? Well, because it's knowable. The pervasion relationship is that all knowable things are also nameable. So here's an example. It's a cloth. It's something which is knowable, and it's nameable. But what if I try to make sure that the relationship between knowability and nameability is really a pervasion relationship by looking for a place where something is not nameable and also not knowable? Well, then I run into a problem. Anything that I consider as a possibility is something, well, that I can know simply by considering it as a possibility. It's something that's known to me. Uh, and so I don't have something which is not knowable and not nameable. Uh, I can even just use a pronoun, that thing, right, or, or give it a name. It's, it's not possible to find something that is knowable and also not nameable. So there may be cases of relationships that I can only come to know through positive examples, and I challenge you to see if you can think of other examples. Now, remember how I said categories are going to be important in understanding Anambhata. Well, here's an inference where we can see that. That's the inference that Earth is something which is different from all other elements. Why? Well, it has smell or it carries odors. The pervasion relationship is that whatever has smell is different from all the other elements other than Earth. Remember that each of these elements has a property that distinguishes it from others. So Earth is whatever thing it is that carries smells. So how can I know that Earth is a unique element, right? It's distinct from water, fire, air, Earth, uh, sorry, air and space. Suppose I go around and I, I examine the elements. I, I look at the things that are different from Earth. So I examine space and I go, okay, no odor there. And then I look at, at water and I say, you know, smell it, I investigate it, nope, no, no odor there, and, and so on for all the other, other elements. Now it seems like I should go out and, and check out Earth and make sure it also has smell and then use that in my reasoning. But here's a problem. And we can understand this problem by looking at an, an example. Suppose I want to prove that Socrates is mortal. I form this pervasion relationship, which is where there is a human, there is mortality. Now, suppose as evidence I go out and I find a person. I find Socrates. Now, here, I'm, I'm really involved in what's called infra, uh, circular, circular reasoning. I'm involved in circular reasoning. I'm using Socrates being mortal in order to prove that Socrates is mortal. And, and that's really a bad way to reason. So here, Socrates is the inferential subject. He's the, the site in the thesis. So he can't be the thing that is support for the thesis. He can't be the example, right? So if we go back to our case of Earth, Anambhata is arguing that likewise, suppose I want to prove that Earth, earthy, earthiness, right, is different from all the other elements. I want to prove this by relying on a general rule, like I did just a moment ago for Socrates. But in that case, we saw that I can't use the thing that I'm trying to prove here, Earth's having smell, in order to construct my general rule. So suppose I found out, uh, went out and found something that has smell. That, that thing's going to be earthen. And using earthen things things that are made of the, the category of earth as evidence for this rule is to employ circular reasoning. So that's what Anambhata means when he says that every subject or every site of earth is also the subject or the site of the inference. I'm trying to prove something about earth so I can't use earth in my evidence. But there's no other positive evidence I can use since it is only earth that has some smell. So one question you might ask about this kind of prover is when can you use it? What kinds of example inferences, other than the example of, of Earth, can we use this sort of reasoning for? Okay, so let's, let's at this point go back and take a look at our argument for Ishvara, for God. What kind of, of uh, agreement is this in terms of the, the, uh, the categories that we've been given? 
absence only, absence and presence, and presence only. So what kind of example is used here? Again, I ask you to complete the quick quiz to test yourself, uh, and you can find out what the answer is. Okay, so now we've looked at inference for oneself and inference for another, and the kinds of provers that we can use to support our, our pervasion relationship. We've seen that inference for Anubhata and Nyaya philosophers is a matter of observation, of generalization, and putting together a specific instance with a general rule in the right way. And the result is then whether you're on your own or you're faced with some doubt or in a debate, uh, faced with an inter interlocutor, somebody that you're debating against, the result is that you, the knower, you come to a moment where you have a cognition, a, a mental event, a moment of knowledge. And that knowledge is caused by the consideration of the prover, like the smoke in the case of fire. Without this step in which you, the knower, puts all the pieces together, there is no knowledge. However, there are cases where we go through what looks like all the right steps, and we fail to have knowledge through inference. So in addition to understanding what counts as good reasoning, we want to also know what counts as bad reasoning so we can avoid it in ourselves and also identify it in others. Now, rather than go through the text and look at each of the five fallacious provers, I'm going to show how some other philosophers might argue that our example inference to the existence of God has some of these fallacies. So what I want to try and do is go a little bit beyond the text and think about how we might apply it to this inference for the existence of God. So before we talk about fallacious provers of inference, let me make an important general point. For Anambhata and other Indian thinkers, if something which seems to be an inference has one of these flaws, it isn't really truly inference. It's something called pseudo-inference. It would be like if you were traveling in the desert and on the horizon there appeared to you a big reflective lake. So here's, a, here's an image. This is not an image of a lake. This is an image of, of, a, of water. Uh, sorry, this is not an image of a lake. This is an image of, of light rays bouncing off of the horizon so it looks like rippling water. It's not actually water. It's, it's pseudo water. And this is how Anambhata thinks of reasoning plagued by a fallacious prover. You might think you've inferred something, but you haven't inferred at all. You've just seemed to infer. For an inference to genuinely be an inference, it must produce knowledge. And knowledge has to be of something which is true. You can't know something false. So let me say this again. In Nyaya philosophy and in most philosophical contexts, it's a contradiction to say I have false knowledge. You can think you had knowledge, and you can turn out to be wrong. Further, inferential knowledge has to be based on consideration of the prover. This is to ensure that your belief isn't an accident. So we want to put all the pieces together and then get knowledge. We're looking for genuine regularities that we can use for the basis of action. So remember, going back to Plato's Phaedo, knowledge is what gets me reliably to Larissa. So Anambhata, he identifies five fallacious provers, and for two of them, he identifies three sub-varieties. We're not going to get into all of that in this lecture. You can talk about it in section, but we'll talk about two of the major five flaws briefly. Now, here's a Buddhist response to this thesis. The thesis is, uh, the world has been made by an intelligent agent. Why? Because it's an effect like a pot. And just as pots are effects of intelligent agents, so too the world is made by an intelligent agent. Our Buddhists are not going to be impressed with the reasoning from something's being an effect to its being caused by an intelligent agent. Now, while they admit that pots are caused by intelligent beings, like potters, they argue that the example here actually goes against the Nyaya point. After all, the Nyaya philosophers want to argue that the kind of intelligent agent here is God or Ishvara. This is an infinite being. But the only intelligent beings we observe making things are finite beings who live and die and are located in one place. So they argue this is a case of a contradicted prover. Being finite is the opposite of being infinite. So the prover actually shows the opposite of what the Nyaya philosopher wants to argue. Ishvara is not a potter. hundred years or so after Anambhata, a Scottish philosopher raises a similar worry as Buddhists do. He says, if we see a house, we conclude with the greatest certainty that it had an architect or a builder. 
because this is precisely that species of effect which we have experienced to proceed from that species of cause. But surely you will not affirm that the universe bears such a resemblance to a house that we can with the same certainty infer a similar cause, or that the analogy is here entire and perfect. Though he worries that we can't draw inferences to something that far beyond our experience. Houses and pots have effects, but the universe is something very um, different, so our reasoning can't reach that far. Now, Nyaya philosophers have a response to this, though it's not in your text, so I'm going to let you think about how they might reply. Let me at least say this much. Suppose you could demonstrate that something which is an effect requires an intelligent agent. And the only kinds of intelligent agents we have seen so far are human beings, but since the effect we observe, the complex universe, is much greater than the effects that we've seen, we infer that a much kind, a greater kind of being is, re is responsible for it. So do you think this kind of reasoning might be successful? That's one question we could ask. Now, there's another worry that Buddhists could have about this inference, and that's this idea of deviating prover. Remember, the prover is supposed to be found wherever the property to be proven is. So where there's smoke, there's fire. But in this instance, they, they think they can show there are cases where the prover is found and the property to be proven isn't. For instance, take growing grass. Grass is an effect of a seed. But the Buddha says there's no need for an intelligent person uh, to make grass grow. This is a case where the pervasion relationship doesn't seem to support the inference. So it's a case where the property to be proven um, trees grow without a person to cause it. The, prop, the prover is found in common with the absence of the property to be proven. So just being in effect isn't sufficient for us to think that it's an intelligent being's activity. One reply is to argue, as Vachaspati, another Nyaya thinker, does, we can't accept the claim, your argument is beset by deviation, since it is seen that without a maker's effort, trees flourish in the forest. Why? Well, because things are included in the inferential site and they're still under dispute. So again, this, this goes back to this idea of the site, the inferential site. If the thing that we're reasoning about is the world, then trees are included in it, and they're still under investigation. In other words, we don't know yet whether trees require an intelligent agent to make them grow. So how can we include pots as an example? Aren't they part of the world? Well, one thing to think is we could divide up the world into things where we've observed an intelligent agent making it and those where we haven't. Pots and houses and artifacts, we've seen an intelligent agent create them. But we're arguing about the rest of the world. Does it require such an agent? So maybe trees and living beings do need God or Ishvara to them, for them to exist and to grow, and maybe he's just the kind of thing we can't directly observe. I mean, after all, potters die after making their pots. Just because we observe them doesn't mean they didn't ever exist. In any case, Nyaya philosophers would argue we haven't yet established facts about the trees, and so they can't be a counterexample. Again, I'll let you think about this response. So now that we've looked at this argument in a bit more detail, I want to hear from you on the discussion on Panopto as to whether you think uh, this kind of inference is a good inference. See if your views have changed. 